So, Sugofta, thank you for being here with me. Uh, this is great to, great to have you. So I've just got a few uh, questions for you about, about the work that you've been doing and about um, working with inclusive solutions, really. So I know that you're a primary teacher and um, I guess people just need to know a bit more about you. Like who, who are you? What do you do for a living? And um, yeah, how does it like, relate to inclusion? Well, thank you for inviting me. It's a real pleasure um, to be speaking to you today. Um, yeah, so I've been a primary school teacher for, gosh, I think around 18 years. Um, I think I've always wanted to be a teacher, um, thinking back now to my childhood. Um, so, it, and it's something I'm still passionate about. Um, for me, my main, uh, main sort of motivation was um, the the freedom that you have and to empower young people and the, these young people are going to go off and become our future and I just love the idea that you can be a part of that and a part of their developing and their thinking and um, a part of their um, becoming um, who they want to be and being part of their aspirations and their dreams. Um, so that, that's sort of me in terms of my profession, but you know, we are more than the jobs that we do. Um, in addition to that, I love to write. Um, I've been writing poetry for, gosh, over 20 years. Mm. Um, and for many years, I didn't share it, you know, because um, I think uh, there has to come a point when you think you're ready to share. And um, yeah, I, I really, really enjoy it. I started, um, doing sort of poetry events, and, you know, the community. Um, I self-published a poetry book a few years ago, um, did a book launch, and all of that's been really, really exciting. And um, I think teaching and the inclusion work, sorry. What's the name of your book? Just shout it out. Oh yeah, okay. So yeah, it's a, um, so for all the fans out there of um, poetry, it's a, um, it's love poetry and it's entitled uh, An Imperfect Love Story. It's available on Amazon. Um, I should have had the book handy yet to, to show you. Um, yeah. <laughs> They're a collection of poems that I've written over, over years. And, you know, um, I thought I'll delve into the world of publishing and, and start having a go. Um, I'm in the process of writing um, something else. Um, I don't think it will be ready in the next few years, I sort of dip into it every now and then and, and do a little bit, you know, um, when I'm feeling inspired. Um, and that's sort of a bit about my own sort of mental health journey. Um, and I think that's just so vital really to, to discuss that. Mm. Um, so in terms of the inclusion work um, and the teaching work, I think we help young people to believe in themselves and to aspire and to fulfill their dreams. And I think it's important to kind of you know, take a dose of that medicine and and for us to work on our dreams. Um, mm. So that's where that idea came from. Mm, that's true. I guess we do all this planning where this person centered planning and think, mm. asking people, what's your dream for your life? And and it's really it gets really, really deep. And then we, I sometimes think, I don't really, I've, I've never done a path for myself. I think that would be really interesting to do that. It'd be a very different yeah. experience probably. And uh, yeah, some people say you should never provide it unless you've had it done to yourself, just because yeah. it's like a, such an intense experience. So you're working in a really, really inclusive uh, mainstream school, right? Yes. Um, so what about that school? Uh, what are they doing so well? What are they doing differently to other schools? Um, I, I've been part of Sealy for the last um, 11 years, coming up to 12 years now. And I just think from the moment I stepped into the doors to come and have a look around, and it was um, actually a few years before I was employed there, straight away I had an instant feeling of feeling welcome. Um, and a lot of our young people, a lot of our parents, a lot of people from our communities, and that's the feeling that a lot of them get. I think the staff and our ethos, it's very inclusive, it's very welcoming, we're very diverse. And, you know, our young people are seeing people who look different to them. Um, they're, you know, they're learning how to respect people who look different to them and who learn in a different way to them and, you know, who have different needs. Um, and that includes, you know, children who might need more support with their behaviour, 
children with physical needs. Um, you know, we have a lot of children with autism, for example, in the school. And, you know, they're, they're integrated into the classroom. And for us as teachers, the, the challenge is, and it's not a challenge really, it's more of a development point, it's about how to make the curriculum more inclusive for them and um, to develop a kind of a broader learning style to make sure that we're accommodating for all those learning styles. Um, you know, for example, some children learn in a visual way. So we need to make sure that we have visual timetables or um, visual prompts that they can use to you know, aid them. Um, we've got a high number of, for example, EAL children who have English as an additional language. Um, so for them, it's ensuring that they get lots of opportunity for actually speaking and practicing their language and, you know, having lots of model modeling and um, lots of scaffolding to support them. Um, and, you know, some children are kinesthetic. So for them, they need to have those regular breaks um, within the classroom and, you know, asking them to sit for an hour or 45 minutes is really difficult. So it's accommodating those breaks, you know, whether it's things like little fidget toys or allowing them to sort of get up and have a little walk around and then sit down again. And all those ways really that, that that's why I think Seely stands out. Um, and the staff are brilliant. So mm, that's really good. So you mentioned quite a few different sort of classroom uh, accommodations that you can make there yeah. are really useful. Are there, are there any other um, like techniques or processes that you, you guys use at this school? Uh, maybe you've used um, peer mediation, is that right? Yes, so we have um, various other things in place. So we have peer mediators for our year six children. And, um, you know, there's an interview process. So the children who want to be part of that are interviewed and they, they apply. Um, which is really, really important because it shows the children how important that role is. And, you know, that role is so important because they go out and um, they work with the children who are younger and sort of model, um, you know, how to resolve um, issues. Mm. Um, one of the other things that we do in our school is restorative justice. So where there has been a dispute between two children, it's really important um, for getting the children to sit down together and actually talking through what's happened, um, speaking about you know how both of the children have felt, and then getting the children to sort of come up with a resolution. And you know it does take time um, to do that. It takes time with both the children. It takes time for the staff member. But that process is so vital, um, and it really teaches the children skills um, of how to communicate effectively and um, how to communicate um, in a difficult emotions and in, you know in a difficult situation and those are life skills that they'll be using hopefully as adults yeah. so I think we really set the trend there for them um, and, and Celia really stands out for doing that I haven't seen that in many other schools um, yeah. yeah I was just wanting to ask you what you think the children uh, feel like going to a school which does all these different things, you know, in a really inclusive way. Then you've got the restorative justice, you've got peer mediation, you've got disabled children in their class, they've got other children in their class that look different to them, and um, everyone just seems to be getting along and they're using these mm. really good sort of uh, restorative practices to, to help make sure everyone gets along. How do you reckon that affects the young people growing up? So how does it affect them? Um, so I think the young people feel welcome, they feel safe. And, you know, that is so vital for them to learn and them to grow as, as young people. And um, I think um, that, so I'm just trying to formulate my thoughts. Um, mm -hmm. it, it gives them the opportunity to see those practices that they're going to be using as adults taking place you know, um, it gives them those role models within within the school environment. And it may be that they may not see that outside of school. And those skills are just so vital. So as they move on to secondary school, you know, they've got those skills in place. And it, I think it makes the children feel safe. And, and that is what a lot of our children say. They feel safe, they feel happy, they feel like they can speak to their teachers, they can speak to the adults if they've got any concerns. Or equally, you know, if there's anything that they enjoy. Um, as well because that that's also really important you know it's learning it's 
it's their learning journey. And as much as we sort of need to follow the curriculum, um, we also um, need to accommodate, you know, their interests as well. Generally, obviously inclusion, the inclusion movement is a massive movement, right? And it's not just about the disabled people and, and it's kind of never has been, but that's all we've sort of focused on before. So what's your vision for inclusion going forward? And it's kind of a big question, but yeah. uh, see where you wanted to go with it. Yeah, I mean, um, there's lots of important issues, um, you know, that are being discussed uh, in the media and, and that are really relevant. So the Black Lives Matter movement, which has been, obviously has been a movement for years and it's an important issue that is really coming um, into the limelight now. And sadly, you know, with the death of George Floyd, um, we've discussed those issues of race and identity um, with the children. And, and that, that's another thing that I think has given the children real sort of empowerment to be able to discuss their concerns and their emotions um, and their feelings about it. And sometimes they do ask difficult questions, which, you know, we can't answer. And mm -hmm. it's, it's saying to the children, actually, you know, sometimes we don't always have the answers to the questions that they have, but, um, you know, we don't always know why people behave in a certain way or why people do the things that they do. But actually, mm -hmm. it's about now moving forward. Um, it's about learning from the past and moving forward and thinking, well, what do we want our future to look like? You know, what do you want in your future? And I always say to the children that my dream for them is that when they grow up, I don't want them to be hearing about these sad things like George Floyd. I don't want them to be hearing that somebody, you know, that somebody has been killed in that way. Um, and I work with a year four class and for, for the children, it was so important for us to discuss that and for them to be able to air their feelings and their emotions about that. And, um, you know, recently there was the anniversary, um, which the year seems to have flown by. Um, it, the, some of the children made posters and, you know, wrote their opinions and things like that. And for those children, it was um, really empowering to be able to share what they thought Mm. Um, and to be able to talk about their identity in that way. Um, ask the question, what did you say to them? What did I say to them? Yeah, so, well, I kept the discussion very open. So it, it was, um, we talked about um, initially when the incident happened, we talked about the actual incident and what had happened. And, you know, there's lots of aids out there, like Newsround, for example, which is very child-friendly. And um, it's speaking about it in a really sort of... Um, open way but making sure it's age appropriate mm. um you know we made sure we did um sort of a silence to respect uh, the, his passing and we gave the children opportunity to ask questions so i think that's the thing that they appreciated it was giving them space and time to be able to ask their questions and share their concerns share their opinions and i often say um, would anybody like to say something or ask anything and i keep it as open as that yeah. Um, and that way, um, some of the children just put their hands up and make, you know, they'll make a comment. Mm -hmm. um, I think this or some children will ask a question and sometimes um, the other children will answer and there ends up being a discussion uh, between the children. And, you know, um, the staff will then facilitate that discussion um, and giving them the skills. So, you know, for example, if there's a disagreement, we can say, oh, I understand what you're saying, but my view is this, or I'm wondering about this. And it's given them the language to be able to communicate, you know, those really difficult conversations. Um, and I just think that's so vital moving forward. So the key really is, I think, keeping the conversation as open as possible, giving the children that opportunity to um, ask questions, share their views, um, and, you know, express themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so important, I think. I mean, in an environment like that where it's really multicultural, yes. growing up alongside each other. I remember for me growing up in a sort of a multicultural uh, school environment, all my best friends were of other races and I just learned so much from them. Mm. And I felt like it was really important for me as a person and helped me you know, forge my identity and, um, you know, maybe question my... Uh, yeah. My, the, the history of our country you know that, that was yeah. a lot of that happening when I was in school so um, mainly when I was in secondary school you know you start to ask the questions you know how 
how we got to where we are right now, you know, there's a lot of unanswered questions because we're not really teaching about a lot of this history, you know, about colonialism. We kind of brush over a lot of stuff yeah. in history lesson. So it was this past couple of years, I've been learning a lot about the history of Britain and, you know, colonialism and all the horrible things that have happened over the years. Yeah. So it's been really eye opening for me personally. And um, I'm sure. Yeah, I seem to, uh, what do you think about teaching children about colonialism? Do you think that's a good idea? Or? I, I, I think it's so vital that children learn about the past because everything that's happened in the past has brought us to this point. And um, it's interesting that you've mentioned about learning about different aspects in history because, you know, I, I think our history curriculum does need reviewing and we do, you know, although it's reasonably broad, I think it could be broader. Um, because sometimes, you know, we're teaching, for example, British history, but it's not inclusive, mm. um, not always inclusive of the children that are in our class mm. um, in terms of their ancestors and where they would have been at that time. So um, a lot of the teachers, we always make a point of saying, you know, trying to put that into a world context. Yeah. So what was happening in other countries at that point and at that time? Um, and I think it can be taught in an age appropriate way because, you know, even if it's shameful, it needs to be shared because we, we need to, the past is there so we can learn lessons um, mm. from it and we can learn how to grow and how to move on from that. And it's really important that children understand that. And, you know, it, again, as I mentioned earlier, it is about having those difficult conversations um, that are really vital for children but again it needs to be age appropriate you know that what you would teach a five-year-old is different to you yeah. know what you would teach a 10-year-old who has a lot more understanding um, and I think you know as they get into secondary school and they're becoming young adults you know that's they need to be leaving school where they've got a really well-rounded understanding of a sort of British history where they live but also their own history about who they are and their ancestry and where they've come from and you know that's so important um, yeah. for, for their identity as a person um you know I, I didn't learn about really my own history um until probably I'd say as an adult so mm -hmm. um because I had parents who who grew up in a different country my family's originally from Kashmir and my parents grew up in Kashmir and then came over to the UK. My dad came over in the 60s um, when a lot of families did that. Um, and so growing up, it was that very, it was, there was that battle of, well, what's my identity? You know, I know I'm British, but then I've got this, um, these cultural references from my family. But then we've got this new culture, which is this British culture, but then it's different to, you know, the rest of my other friends. So it was really kind of developing, you know, what's my identity, who am I? And I think for young people now, I think there's 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 a lot more awareness um, than there definitely was when I was sort of growing up. And, you know, at school, I don't remember learning anything really that I could relate to that was to do with me um, as my identity. And, the fact that our young people are is just so important. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. You know, I remember just being taught about the Romans and about the Greeks and about yeah. the Vikings, and that was it. Really, we didn't really learn about history from the rest of the world, which is so so vital, especially mm. now. You know, it's a completely different world to back then, and also the internet. You know, the access to all the information is on our fingertips. You know, we're ready. We've got it in our mm. pocket. Or everything we could possibly want to know is right there. So it's yeah. kind of changing what young people are aware of, I think. Yeah. I mean, you uh, taking just the example of the Romans, um, yeah. you know, the Romans invaded um, North Africa as well. Yeah. So, you know, there's an opportunity there to discuss, well, what's the culture, you know, what was the culture of North Africa at that mm -hmm. time? What were the languages there at that time? Yeah. You know, why did they invade? There must have been a reason, you know, um, and looking at sort of maybe notable people who were in the Roman army, who were not from Rome, who were from, you know, who were of African descent. So there's all kinds of ways that you can actually adapt your curriculum. And like you say, you know, there are lots of resources online. Um, I would say, you know, for example, in, for primary, it's a bit more limited because they need to be 
age appropriate so it's about making sure you know are they child friendly for example is there a nice powerpoint that you could use in your classroom or are teachers having to do the research and then create the resources and it's trying to bridge that gap really but there are all, all sorts of ways in the meantime that we can kind of stretch the curriculum. And, you know, we've done that. So uh, an example is we've talked about the Egyptians um, just recently, and the children have loved the topic. So before we started the topic, um, the first couple of lessons was about African civilizations and what they brought to the world. And, you know, for the children, that was so you know, powerful because a lot of the children didn't know about that. And some of the children went away and did their own research. Um, we made it cross curricular and then they created PowerPoints, you know, in pairs and, and then did a presentation about it. And it, it was just brilliant for them. And it really set the scene. Um, so, the, so we're moving away from that unconscious bias about, you know, Africa, for example, I'm choosing Africa, you know, yeah. people in Africa being a, a certain way, being impoverished. It was a completely different world years ago, so it's really important that children know that. They make a, a joke about, you know, when, when we were sort of barbarians and yes. they were having like, you know, building pyramids and stuff like yes, that. Yeah, yeah. Sort of uh, kind of ironic. Um, well, another question I wanted to ask you is about, I've uh, been thinking about teaching young people about uh, race and racism and, you know, identity. And one of the things, one of the ideas that I saw on this Channel 4 program called The School That Tried to End Racism, which is yes, really yeah, powerful, yeah. the affinity groups idea, um, which is where you basically separate the two groups based on their races or like white or non-white and you separate them all. And you say mm -hmm. to them, oh, what does your race mean to you? What does your ethnicity mean to you? And they'll kind of come back together and talk about the conversations that they've had mm -hmm. and discuss it. I think that that kind of thing sounds really, um, really powerful. Have you had any thoughts? About I, I, I watched that program and I just think it was, I think it was brilliant. And I remember some of the young people being really uncomfortable mm -hmm. about segregating. Yeah. And I remember the distinction between the two groups because, um, or between the, the groups, um, some of the um, young white children, they were really uncomfortable about being grouped together and, it was a really quiet group. I remember the program really well, and they were they were trying to talk about their history, whereas the other groups, you know, they were really animated and they had lots to say. Um, yeah, something like that would be um, would be excellent. Um, yeah, to do. I, I would love to see that. That'd be cool. Maybe we should try and make it happen. So, um, yeah, there's one kid on that program and he said, I'm just a ginger European boy. Something like that. And I just made me laugh. I just remember that kid's face while he was crying and stuff. But it was, um, it was striking, wasn't it? Because the other group was like, having a party and they sounded like they were having a great time. And then this other group, just full of the white children, were just sort of sitting there really, uh, really upset, basically, that they were being separated from everyone else. So, yeah, it's interesting. Um, yeah, there's obviously some good ways of talking about race with children and talking about these important, important things and just doing it in the right way, I guess. That's the, uh, the question is, how do we get that right? Also, religion as well. Obviously, some people like yourself, you know, wearing a headscarf, it's, a, it's like a visible thing. So I'm sure that over your, throughout your life, yeah, at some point, it maybe it's become, uh, made you feel different. And so how do you, what do you, what's your advice to teachers uh, who want to make sure all children feel included and welcome so again you know that's a really good question and it goes back to that idea of identity and children children need to see people who look like them mm. so um you know for example um you mentioned the the headscarf that i wear the hijab mm -hmm. um for some of our young girls you know who whose parents wear hijabs or they might wear hijabs it really makes them feel empowered to see somebody in a position, you know, who's, who's a teacher, somebody in a position of influence who's wearing a hijab and is able to work and, you know, get on with their everyday life. Um, and I think it's, um, it's really important for young people to learn about other people's faiths, because the more we know about other people and other cultures, um, you know, the less people seem alien and the other 
And I think sometimes um, racism and, you know, um, Islamophobia and other um, issues, people make other people become the other. So when somebody is the other, they're, they're detached from them. They're detached from understanding, you know, um, what their cultural identity is. And this person becomes, this group of people becomes somebody different. Whereas actually it's, it's about sharing the similarities. Yes, there may be differences in our beliefs, in our religion, but there's lots of things that are the same about, about us, you know, um, things that are the same about humanity, you know, our, the fact that we care for our families, the fact that we care for each other. And I think one thing that really demonstrated that well was, you know, the, the lockdown, the first lockdown we had um, in the UK. And it, while it was a really frightening time and we didn't know what was going to happen and there was there was an element of panic and panic buying and all sorts of things, what I saw was people coming together. I saw communities coming together. Um, an example is my neighbours set up a, um, the neighbours sort of down the road, they popped their number on a piece of paper and put it to everybody's door mm -hmm. and we set up a WhatsApp group. And, you know, just having that, that group, um, it was, it really felt like a relief yeah. because um, I remember I had to isolate and there was a neighbour who had to, you know, a couple of us had to isolate and, and so on. And, you know, having somebody who could go and get you um, some milk and bread <laughs> from the shops, you know, and they were your neighbours and ordinarily, I, you know, we never would have even spoken to each other. Um, but now they were going to get those things and they were saying, oh, don't worry about paying. It's fine. It's only milk and bread. And, you know, people coming forward and wanting to help each other and wanting to come together, which which tells me and shows me that at at a lower level, at a base level, we want that connection with each other, regardless of our race, regardless of our beliefs, regardless of our colour. And regardless of our you know, sexual orientation or anything, we want that connection with each other. And the thing that holds that connection back is not knowing and not understanding um, how we differ. Mm. Um, it, and something really interesting comes to mind. I remember watching a program, I, I forget what it was called, it was a while back. Um, and it was, um, it was a really interesting concept. They had a human library, if you, if you say, something along those lines. And so they had different groups of people who'd come from different walks of life. Um, so somebody from a certain religion, somebody um, you know who dressed a certain way, and what people would do is they would choose to sit down and have a conversation with them for an hour to find out more about them. And I just thought, what a brilliant concept! I would, I just think that's incredible. So you know, it, it's kind of like you would check out a book, but what you would do is you go to the library and you'd say, "Well, I want to have a conversation um, with." So and so, you know, I don't have any experience of, I don't know, for example, let's say you don't know anybody who's Muslim, or you sit down and have a conversation with somebody who's a Muslim, yeah, and ask them the questions, and you know, and, and ask them the things that you you want to know, <laughs> and you know, yeah. yeah, and by the end of it, it was a trial that was run. Um, uh, I've tried to find it a few times actually. I, I'm thinking it must be somewhere, um, and. All the people were saying that they've just got that better understanding mm. of somebody. And, you know, I, I just think that's so powerful yeah. because then that person is not the other. That's that person, a, yeah. I mean, yeah. the class of children who could have them sit yeah. down with someone who was maybe gay and then sit yeah. down with someone who's Muslim and then, yeah. see, you know, who's black. Yeah. Who's yeah. All about the different experiences. Different experiences, yeah. Happen. And that's really interesting, yeah. Yeah, I think that would that would be really interesting. Um, and with this, you know, if we did it with young people, we'd have to sort of give them the skills about, you know, how we sort of communicate with each other um, in a respectful way. You know, what kind of questions can we ask? Um, how do we disagree with somebody if we, mm. if we disagree? But you know, the focus of that was not about agreeing or disagreeing. It was actually just getting to know that person. And, yeah. I think it's all about trust and fear and like if you don't you know it's the unknown you're always scared of the unknown right and I guess it's a kind of human nature it's a self-protection kind of thing uh, self-preservation I think what they call it I guess that's why we're scared of the dark because you don't know what's in the dark <laughs> so if there's someone who's completely what you see as completely different to you yeah. based on these uh, prejudices or their physical appearance or whatever it might be 
when you actually break down those barriers, you realize that, you know, actually, we're actually both people, we both, you know, eat food in the daytime and we sleep at nighttime, you know, we both have a very similar experience of life yeah, for, yeah. for certain reasons. Yeah, so, it's those universal values, aren't they? They're, they're the same. It, it's the little things that are different. You know, the, those basic values for humanity, that, that is what is the same, you know, for mm -hmm. different cultures and different people. Definitely. It's really down to the fundamentals here. Mm -hmm. So anything we can do to help the children break down those barriers as well, really early on in life, I think that's really important. So you're doing some great work. Is there Thank any, you. Do you have any other advice for uh, teachers wanting to make their classroom just feel really, really inclusive? Um, my advice is just to be really open. Just, just be really open, you know, open to um, what children have to say. Give children opportunity to, to speak because, it, and it's really thinking about how the types of questions we ask, really making sure that your questions are open. Because if we're asking closed questions, we're going to get closed answers. Mm. And, you know, um, one of the other strategies that we've got um, is sometimes if we discuss a particular issue, which might be a sensitive issue or a difficult issue, sometimes what we'll do is set up a box. Um, we have one in the classroom anyway, which is called a worry box. Mm -hmm. So if children have any concerns, um, they write a worry mm. and put it in the box and um, they can write. We ask them to write their name because we want to discuss it with them. Um, but, you know, sometimes if they don't want to, they can keep it anonymous and it means that we might discuss it as a class. Um, so if it's a specific issue or sensitive issue, we would have a, a, a box for that area. So we'll say, if you would like to say anything or you'd like to ask a question or a concern, just pop it in the box. And, you know, some children, some of the quiet children will write, will write something. They'll write a question. I'm really worried about this. I don't understand this and you know it's really really nice because it means that um, you can sit down and have a conversation with them you know one to one and give them that time that they need so my advice um, for any teachers you know to create a more inclusive classroom is maybe set up you know that set up as many different ways for the children to be able to communicate um, because not all children will put their hands up and share their answers and not all children will come and speak to you but you know that might be another way having a worry box where they can draw a picture or write a question or share a concern that, yeah. you know, and they may feel comfortable doing that um, the other strategy that we use we have a creative writing session once a week where the children choose what they want to write about and it's a completely sort of free writing session. And it really just gives them that space to, you know, write about something that's important to them. Um, some children write stories and that's a way of expressing themselves and expressing their ideas. Um, an example is, you know, we did some work about um, uh, homophobia day, um, I think it was a couple of weeks back. And one of the children wrote a story and it was about the character sort of addressing, you know, homophobia. And so that was her way of applying that understanding and putting it into a context of a story. Um, so, you know, giving, this, giving the children, though, that opportunity to be open and to, um, to feel like their opinions and their questions and their concerns matter and, mm -hmm. and giving them that space, I think that's vital. Nice one. Thank you. Thank you. Very good answer. Uh, is there anything else you want to say? Any messages that you want to leave or any words you want to, like poems or anything like that you want to leave us? Oh, of course. I wanted to share the um, guest house poem with you. Mm -hmm. The guest house. Um, this is Mevlana Rumi, who's a 13th century Sufi poet, um, and he's Persian. Um, this this being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes and an, as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Even if there are crowds of sorrows, you violently sweep your house, empty of its furniture. Still, treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each one has been sent as a guide from beyond.
thank you so much thank for you. sharing that with us and sharing your wisdom. So yeah, really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much.